Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the over 130 people on the webinar right now. Uh, we welcome you to Making Privacy and Consent Rules Work for Family Caregivers. Uh, this is a webinar that we're putting on to discuss our report, uh, Making Privacy and Consent Rules Work for Family Caregivers. Uh, if you haven't already, I recommend you go to our website and download that report. Um, it's a great resource that we've put together, and uh, in just a few minutes, Genevieve Obarski from the Change Foundation will go into why we developed this uh, resource to begin with. Um, we're excited to have so many people on today. We know the interest is, uh, we have, there's great interest across the province and across the country. Um, so before I uh, hand this, the mic over to Genevieve and Mary Jane Dykeman, um, I just wanna go over a few things. Um, my name is Catherine monk Sagel, and I'm the Program and Communications Associate here at the foundation. I'll be monitoring the chat and the conversation throughout the webinar. Please feel free to uh, post questions that you may have uh, in that section. We'll, I'll be monitoring that throughout, but we'll be taking questions at the end. The presentation will run for about 45 minutes and we will answer as many questions as we can uh, at the end of that presentation. I know several people had sent in questions and we have accommodated those throughout the presentation. So um, our hopes are to answer as many at the end as we possibly can. Um, after the survey, you are sorry, after the webinar, you'll be directed uh, to a survey. Uh, we just want to know a little bit about what you learned or how you're going to utilize this tool um, in your practice. We also just want to get a sense of who may have been on the webinar. This will also be sent out tomorrow if uh, you don't have time to fill that out today. And. Um, I also, uh, for those that may not be subscribed to our e-newsletter, Top of Mind, I highly recommend when you're on our website downloading the report that you sign up for that to stay up to date on the latest uh, foundation news and insights from our staff and our CEO. Um, so everyone will be muted. Uh, your video will not work. This is... Uh, this is just a one-way communication from us to you, but please feel free to communicate in the chat throughout. So uh, without further ado, I will hand, uh, hand this over to our, present, our presenters, uh, Genevieve Obarski from the Change Foundation and Mary Jane Dykeman from DDO Health Law. Thanks very much, Catherine. Uh, this is Genevieve Obarski from the Change Foundation, and on behalf of myself and our staff here and our CEO, Kathy Fuchs, thank you so much to the uh, folks who've joined us now. I think we have over 300 people that have expressed interest, and I'm sure they're clicking on as we speak. So, uh, obviously, um, this is a topic that's important for lots of folks in the healthcare field. So thank you very much for joining us today. So what we're going to do today is um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about why the Change Foundation um, in our focus on family caregivers um, went into this work on a privacy and consent uh, law along with Mary Jane Dykeman. And then Mary Jane is going to give us a good overview of the privacy and consent legislation. Uh, and as Catherine said, it will incorporate many of the uh, questions that we already received. Uh, and hopefully some of the questions you may have in your mind will get answered there as well. And we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. So just a little bit of introduction as to why the Change Foundation got into this um, doing a report on privacy and consent rules. Uh, we did a lot of engagement in 2015 and 16 with both family caregivers all across Ontario in many different caregiving settings and with health and community care providers across the province. Uh, again, in all kinds of settings um, and pretty much all regions of the province. And one thing we heard consistently from caregivers was that providers often uh, told them that they couldn't share health information for privacy reasons, but there seemed to be uh, those things were just sort of thrown up as a barrier without clear understanding on both sides as to what the privacy rules were. Um, and we also heard from providers that they were uncertain at times about when uh, and how to use privacy and consent rules. And the privacy and consent legislation was often used as an overarching reason as to why patient information couldn't be shared with the family caregiver, even when consent had been given. So um, those were things heard during that uh, engagement that we did. Uh, caregivers face a lot of information challenges, including having to make repeated efforts to get copies of health records, and often from a variety of uh, providers, uh, they're often refused access to copies of test results or other health records, 
And uh, what we what we heard a lot from family caregivers is they they often have important insights into the care of a person, but are sometimes ignored. Uh, and the privacy and consent laws are used as a barrier for them providing that information. Um, so it's frustrating for family caregivers. Providers also face a lot of challenges. Um, sometimes it's hard to respond to a caregiver's request for information when there's no record that the caregiver is legally authorized. And we'll talk about a lot of that in the presentation. Care, uh, providers told us it's hard for them to sometimes identify the primary family caregiver where there's multiple family members involved in supporting the patient. And we'll, we'll talk about some scenarios involving that. And sometimes it's hard to work with family members of patients who are incapable of making treatment decisions and also when there are disagreements within the family about the best course of treatment. So we hope to clarify some of those situations and send everybody away with a more uh, clear understanding of what the actual privacy and consent rules are. So the report that we've published that's available on our website is called Making Privacy and Consent Rules Work for Family Caregivers. And we hope it also works for healthcare providers. And basically it's a report that we did, which we'll highlight much of today, which is a primer on the current legislation of the Healthcare Consent Act of 1996 and on the collection use and disclosure requirements set in the Personal Health Information and Protection Act, which uh, we often call PHIPAA. The report that we did, um, which we collaborated with Mary Jane Dykeman on, included descriptions of, includes descriptions of legal capacity for consent, rules about collecting and disclosing personal health information, rules about when the patient is deemed incapable to consent, and the hierarchy of substitute decision makers, as well as we'll go through a few case studies. And this is where many of the questions that were submitted ahead of time will, will likely be answered. And then the report also includes information on where to go for more help. So I'm gonna now uh, turn it over to Mary Jane Dykeman and let her walk us through some of the features of the report that will help uh, illuminate some of these rules for us. You want me to work the controls? Sure. Okay, them. I'm gonna take over the mouse <laughs> and we're gonna jump in. And my special thanks to the Change Foundation because this has been such a wonderful opportunity over many months now to put our heads together and to really drill down to what is worrying to family caregivers and also to the health practitioners who are supporting that client patient resident. So first of all, we'll talk about the consent to collect information from caregivers because as Genevieve has pointed out, it can be extremely frustrating sometimes when someone is the main support for that individual and yet they are trying to tell the practitioner something and the practitioner is saying, I'm not sure if I can take that in information from you. So there's some difficulty on both sides. And we wanted to be very fair to the healthcare providers because although it's seen as a barrier, we have to sort out what are they experiencing. Mm -hmm. So healthcare providers are telling us that they're concerned that they don't have the consent to collect the information and sometimes they just put a big stop sign up. If the provider can't get the information directly from the patient, so of course, if I were to say, look, I'm the caregiver for Genevieve, and Genevieve says, no, she's capable and says, no problem, please let Mary Jane have the information, that's great. That's consent, and we always want to follow the consent. It gets frustrating when someone goes from one practitioner to another and you're continually mm. having, and so it's almost as though we need to script the caregiver to say, well, in fact, my mother gave consent or my sister or my daughter gave consent. There is one option. If, if a practitioner can't uh, typically get the information directly from the person in a timely or accurate way, so let's yeah. say that you may be incapable or you're unable to communicate they are able under PHIPAA, the health privacy legislation, to collect it from someone else if they can't get it in an accurate or timely way. Now, the person could come back later and say, I can't believe that you collected it from my sister. You didn't have my consent. And then the, the patient or client could instruct the practitioner not to use it. So that's one of the pitfalls in a way, but it's meant to protect people's rights. And this is one of the challenges in drafting legislation and creating rules that actually work at the front line, that they can be practical and 
have enough flex and give people the tools, but it's that script behind uh, behind legislation. How does it really work and how do we help you navigate your way through and how do we support the providers as well? One of the other provisions I want to quickly mention is you can always, a healthcare provider can always disclose personal health information to eliminate or reduce the significant risk of serious bodily harm. So that's a particular section of PHIPAA. It's not a duty to warn, but it's a discretion. So if there were a high risk situation and you are a family member, let's say of, of a son, we're gonna to come to a scenario later, of a son who, for whom you wanna give some information, you could even remind the practitioner, listen, I know you, you're worried that you can't collect this information from me, but I think you probably can based on timeliness and accuracy, and you can perhaps disclose information to me to eliminate or reduce the significant risk of serious bodily harm. So uh, again, it, it, it goes both ways. Yeah, thanks, Mary Jane. One of the questions we received ahead of time was about whether it's okay for a family member to provide information, uh, and it is under that uh, provision that she just talked about where someone might be suicidal or in danger of hurting themselves or someone else, it, it is okay to share that information. But right, so it the, and it shares those, yeah. both ways, and we're going to get into the scenario because there are a couple of layers coming up in the scenario we've called Andrew, where Andrew presents in the eMERGE and the family is desperately trying to give information. So if, if Andrew were on a Form 1, for example, under the Mental Health Act, an application for psychiatric assessment, there's actual legal authority embedded in a Form 1 so the practitioner can collect collateral information. But we're also talking about, well, what if it's not at a Form 1 stage? I think it probably would be in that scenario. But what if it's not yet and the family is trying to give information? So you've got the timeliness and accuracy in terms of the practitioner collecting it, in terms of the practitioner actually disclosing. It's a somewhat high threshold, but, but the bottom line in privacy is we do not want privacy to cost lives. And the former commissioner Health Information uh, Information and Privacy Commissioner, rather, Dr. Ann Kabukian, said that at the outset when PHIPA was being drafted years ago, privacy should not impede care or create an unsafe situation. So um, another point to consider is a health practitioner also has to consider many caregivers will accompany a patient to an appointment. And I am sure their practices vary. They may decide to have a separate conversation with you to say, is it okay if I'm in the room or mm -hmm. is it okay if you have a conversation? And again, the, the nod to practitioners is not to assume just because someone comes and is making the appointment and doing the driving and supporting the person that you're free to, to have the conversation. But I think there's a way to do it. Simply say, mm -hmm. I see you're here with your daughter. Would you mind if if uh, or do you have any objection to her being part of it, et cetera. So again, it's, it's I, I say that providers need to read the room. And even if someone says, oh yes, that's okay, but their eyes are signaling, no. <laughs> Sometimes we've had people come back later and say, I know I said that you could share things or do this in an ongoing way, but I really, really don't want you to tell my parent or my sibling or my husband about X amount of information. So we have to take care. So Mary Jane, what, uh, what are some strategies that people can use uh, when a patient capa is capable, and we'll get into the test for, for capacity in a minute, um, when they capably tell the provider not to share information with the caregiver for whom many times that information is important. So what are some sort of nuanced ways we can move into that um, I or do, address that situation? Yeah, I think it's so important that there be that nuanced approach because you could instruct that health practitioner, don't share information with my family. Fair enough, that is your right. And the whole bundle of legislation in Canada and in Ontario, many of you will be quite aware, it's very much bound up in the individual's rights. Even where some families or caregivers might say they're a bit frustrated with that. So I'm not saying override and trample your rights to say, no, don't share. But we have said to health practitioners, is there any opportunity to unpack it a little bit and say to you, all right, Genevieve, 
Is there any information in particular that you're concerned about? Are you concerned that we're going to make a copy and hand over every single record of the past mm. three years as you've been through this journey of whatever the health crisis is? Is it that you don't want a particular encounter to be shared? Is it on an ongoing basis? I think if practitioners take that pause to explore it a little bit, and again, not consider the request as the stop sign. Oh, you're saying you don't want it shared? Oh, thank you. We won't have to talk about that anymore. So it may just be that pause. And then if the answer is truly no, and there is no middle ground that it, you know, be certain select notes or reports or discharge summary or whatever it is, if you are truly saying to the practitioner, it's my right and I do not want you to share any information with this person, regardless of the fact that that person is going to pick me up when I'm discharged from hospital and take me home to live with them, or they'll drive me to my next appointment or whatever it is, then the answer is no. But at least you have a bit of a backdrop behind it as well. So if the answer is still no, uh, there are a couple things the healthcare providers can do for a family caregiver that might be frustrated about not getting information. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. And these may not give a whole lot of comfort, frankly, to a family member, caregiver, who is feeling shut out and yet they're still experiencing all of the responsibilities of caregiving. So a healthcare provider who has been told by you, don't share anything, period, unless you step into a role, for example, as substitute decision maker, then you're going to get mm -hmm. those rights. Or there's some other legal authority to give it to you, including if I said as practitioner, oh, I need to disclose this to you to reduce or eliminate a significant risk of serious bodily harm, there can always be some other legal authority as well. But assuming we've had that pause, we've had the discussion, and then we're in this situation with a healthcare provider who now has to go back to the caregiver to say, I don't, I don't have permission to share anything. They could offer supportive information more generally, uh, links to resources, even a, a, you'd have to take care. Of course, if the family caregiver doesn't know what the diagnosis is in the first place, you don't want to be saying, but we can give you helpful links to <laughs> schizophrenia yeah. or dementia or whatever, whatever yeah. it is. So, so they will have to take care. Uh, there is a provision in PHIPA where if someone is a patient in a hospital or a resident of long-term care, there are some special rules within PHIPA that would still permit someone to call the hospital or to present at the hospital or long-term care home to say, is Genevieve a patient or resident here? So if you want to send flowers, they're allowed to confirm that the mm -hmm. person is here. Now there are a couple of rules for those healthcare organizations. Again, it's only hospitals and long-term care homes. They have to have made it clear in some way, and they usually do it by posting a notice that this is what they do and you have the right to say no. Mm. I'm not sure how often people really appreciate that, but the written notice is adequate mm -hmm. so that you could say, I don't care about flowers. I don't want anyone to know that I'm here. One of the catches in that particular provision in PHIPA that I think is a little problematic is the fact that not only can the hospital or the home confirm that you are a patient or resident, they can also tell the person where you are. Mm. So if I am a patient of a hospital, and then you say, yes, she's up in you know postpartum, <laughs> or she's in a cardiac unit, or she's in a mm. forensic unit, or mood disorder, you know, whatever that is, to my mind, that has the potential to mm. give you some personal health information. It was drafted very specifically to permit that, but again, um, that that's something mm. to consider. So in, in short, hospitals and homes can share the fact that the person is there as long as they put up the notice and you didn't say, no, no, I, I, I don't want anyone to know that I'm here. There's also an opportunity, of course, to have the healthcare organization contact a relative friend or potential substitute decision maker. So if you say to the health practitioner, I don't want you to ever talk to my family, well, if you need to have a substitute decision maker, that organization is going to have to reach out to figure out who is that, who's going to step into that role. And we're going to talk a lot more about substitute decision making right. um, as we go forward. So we're going to switch a little bit now and talk about, um, <clears throat> we've been talking about people giving consent for sharing information. Um, can we talk a little bit about a, a, 
patient's capacity to give consent. And are we talking about consent for treatment or for information sharing, which is what we were talking about previously. So take us through what makes somebody capable to be able to give consent. And really from the Change Foundation's point of view, when we started this project, we were mainly focusing on privacy. But when we put our heads together, we thought fairly early on, it's hard to have an isolated discussion about privacy and information sharing absent the context of treatment decisions that pull someone into the healthcare system. And the fact is the framework for PHIPAA, the health privacy legislation, was actually built on the same model as the Healthcare Consent Act. So there are rules around consent, there are rules around capacity, and there are rules around substitute decision-making. So let's focus for a moment on capacity. Patients, clients, residents are presumed to be capable. So we are all, generally speaking, going to be presumed to be capable. That can be displaced, of course, if there's reason to think oh gosh, I'm not sure based on what I'm seeing and hearing that you are, and then we'll talk about what the test is. There's no minimum or maximum age. So there, in short, there's no age mm -hmm. for consent, uh, capacity to consent. So it's not as though you say you're only capable to make a treatment decision once you hit 16 or capable uh, only until you're 70 or 80 or 90. It's all about the legal test for capacity, which we'll review, not about age and not about diagnosis either. So whether mm -hmm. I have schizophrenia or dementia or an acute illness or a chronic illness, legal test. And if I am capable, I get to make my own treatment decisions. And the same goes, we'll come into some of the rules around PHIPAA. It's the same thing. If I'm capable, I get to make decisions about how my information flows and is collected, used, and disclosed, other than if PHIPAA says, there's other legal authority. And I think it's interesting too that um, as one of the bullets on the slide shows that you could be capable for giving consent for one treatment but not mm -hmm. another. So maybe I think we'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about how we decide if someone's capable. Um, so as she said, just the, the emphasis is on it's not about the diagnosis or the age. It's right. a case-by-case case thing depending on the treatment um, and the situation of the person. Right, even if a person is of advanced age and let's say they slip, they've got neuropathy in their feet, they slip, they fall, maybe they break an ankle, quite capable to make a decision about having the ankle set or whatever other proposed treatment there would be. It doesn't mean that they are necessarily capable, they're gonna be presumed capable for every other decision, but there could be something else, another mm -hmm. intervention proposed that in their state of dementia that they are unable to consent to. So we see that a lot in mental mm -hmm. health, for example. I could consent, again, to have my arm set, but I may not recognize that I have a mental illness such that if we're talking about antipsychotics, I mean, I may understand the information you're giving me, but I don't think it applies to me because I don't have insight into my illness. So That's it's important a good to keep example, that in mind. Yeah. So, just, we're going to talk now about what is the legal legal test for capacity consent and and how important is it to get this really right this one's important so again it's not about age it's not about diagnosis but it's a legal test for capacity it's set out in section four of the Healthcare consent act the test is also in PHIPAA vis-a-vis -vis information decisions and we'll return to that but let's just look at it through treatment lens right now so two things have to be in place the person has to be able to understand the information that's relevant to making the decision about the treatment. And we really have to stress that it's an ability to understand. It's not, did you understand? It's your cognitive capacity to be able to take in the information and understand it. And you have to meet both prongs of the test. If you fail on one, then you are not capable to consent to that particular decision. The second one, is you must be able to appreciate the reasonably foreseeable consequences of saying yes or no to whatever's being proposed. And what we've seen over time is that sometimes the person is quite able to understand the information, as I said. Oh, I understand that intellectually. I'm cognitively able to understand it. I know what you're saying to me. They may not be able to appreciate the reasonably foreseeable consequences of the decision. And a, a 
you know, an example is someone who, if they don't think that they have what you've diagnosed, they may not believe that the, the treatment will be applicable to them, but are they able to appreciate the reasonably foreseeable consequences? Cognitive test, and someone could be quite ill or even psychotic, that, would, that latter piece might be more of a stretch, but you could still be capable. A person, again, with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's could still be capable to consent to a variety of treatments. Mm -hmm. And the same thing goes, this is the same test in terms of collection, use, and disclosure of personal health information, am I capable to make decisions about that? And if I'm not, one of the things in the drafting of PHIPAA in the health information framework was that, I suppose the discussion was, oh, does someone have to go over here to the Healthcare Consent Act and get it all sorted and then trot back over here and start all over again? And the answer was no. If someone becomes a substitute decision maker for treatment under the Healthcare Consent Act, they automatically are able to make those information mm. sharing decisions. So uh, I don't know that that always helps. It, it's possible that there could be an information decision that has nothing to do with treatment. So we used to use an example of camp notes. If my son wants to go to camp, I'm going to I'm going to come to some rules, special rules in PHIPA around health privacy and decisions in children. Because I can tell you the Healthcare Consent Act, we just said there's no age. There's a bit of a subset in PHIPAA, so maybe we'll wait and come to that. Yeah, that's good, because we got a question about uh, s someone interested in sharing some pediatric examples. So let's talk about if someone is deemed incapable by the legal test for capacity, who is their substitute decision maker, which I'm sure you've noticed by now, we've abbreviated as SDM in these slides. So talk, talk us through who can be a substitute decision maker and, and the ranking of them. This one's really important because sometimes there may be a caregiver who is accompanying the person to appointment. So we don't, as important as that is, we can't assume legally that that is the person who is the highest ranked on this list. It's truly a hierarchy. So let's say that Genevieve is found incapable based on the legal test that we just went through, the ability to understand the information, the ability to appreciate the reasonably foreseeable consequences of whatever's being proposed. We find you incapable. And then we say, well, who will be her substitute decision maker? And so we go to section 20 of the Healthcare Consent Act and we start at the top. So really quickly, we don't have to pause a lot. Guardian of the person is a court application and it is not typically turned to in some sectors like the developmental uh, disability sector you will see it more often I've only had a couple of of these kinds of cases of guardianship over the years usually someone else is in the wings without it coming to that the second one attorney for personal care so that is a person who is named in a power of attorney that person is called the attorney for personal care and you could choose or may have chosen in your life, all of you, to get a power of attorney document and say, if and when I become incapable, I name someone. So you don't, the, the good thing here is under Section 20 of the Healthcare Consent Act, everyone in Ontario has a default substitute decision maker. Even if you don't have a power of attorney, there may be a good reason for you to go and do a power of attorney for personal care. As an aside, you'll want to do one for property because there's no similar list like this in the Substitute Decisions Act, but guardian of the person, attorney for personal care, healthcare practitioners and organizations will often ask the family members or ask the patient if they're there, did you ever sign a power of attorney? Could we have a copy of it? Because it may lay out who it is. Is it one person? Is it two people jointly ranked? The other thing to remember with this list is if someone is listed here, for example, if you go down further to Number five, child or parent. Well, you could have multiple adult children of an elderly person, for example, or you could have the parents of a child. So you have more than one default mm. substitute decision maker equally mm -hmm. ranked. That means that those people must make the decision together. Mm. Someone can go to the Consent and Capacity Board, an independent tribunal, to be appointed a representative. That's not uh, terribly common, so we'll just carry on. Most often you start, once you get through those first three, you start with family members. So spouse or partner, highest ranked, spouse includes same-sex partner now in Ontario. 
child or parent. So again, it could be the adult child of, it could be the parent or two parents of a child or even an adult. There may be the, the highest rank group is in fact the parents of someone who's 35 or 21 or whatever it is. So quite often this is where we see the child or the parent making the decision. One of the scenarios I sometimes look at has both a parent and a child. I, I think of someone who, mm. let's say it's someone who's my age, who has children <laughs> who are at least 16 who would be substitute decision makers, as well as my parents. There is a scenario where they could all mm. be mm. pulled in together. Now, no one needs to be a substitute decision maker. They could decline to be, but it's just, a caution that we don't want caregivers to assume that they are the substitute decision maker, nor do we want health practitioners to assume that that person, that caregiver is the substitute decision maker. So even today, if you are a caregiver to someone, take a look at this list and figure out, gosh, would it be me mm -hmm. going forward? There's always the opportunity that the, the person, the patient could sign a, a power of attorney for personal care to name that caregiver if they are way down the ranking. And again, it's a low threshold to sign a power of attorney. So all of which to say you go down through the ranking, you will likely be looking at family members. There may be questions from the practitioners about who else is there? Sometimes we come into cases only to find out that, oh my gosh, there was a spouse and nobody ever asked, <laughs> was the person married? Or there might be other siblings who are equally ranked, but we've just turned to the people who are coming mm -hmm. to appointment. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a caution as yeah. well. Find out really early. And if you can't, if nobody gives you the appropriate information as to whether or not there is a, if they won't tell you who the sibling is, you don't have to go to the ends of the earth to try to find that person either. So then you go down and you get to any other relative and ultimately you may get to public guardian and trustee which is a government body substitute decision maker of last resort the only other thing i want to say about the pgt public guardian and trustee is that again this government office can be called on if there is a dispute between two or more equally ranked substitute decision makers so let's say genevieve and i are siblings we're caring for our mother who's elderly the healthcare organization says is there a power of attorney we pull it out we're both named now we would have been equally ranked further down but let's say up here we're equally ranked and we don't agree and this is a scenario that we see quite often the siblings either the parents don't agree about the child's care or the siblings the adult children don't the person's care and then all of a sudden there's a dispute that's the point at which it must be the public guardian and trustee. But I would hope that the healthcare mm. organizations are saying, all right, you two need to sit down, sort it out, you need to agree. Otherwise, unfortunately, we would have to go to the public guardian or trustee, and I'm sure that's not what your mom wanted. Right. So ideally, it gets sorted out and people come together. So Mary Jane, it sounds like it's really important for caregivers to know uh, who the patient substitute decision maker Absolutely. is, it, whether it's them or it could be somebody else. Because if and when the yeah. person becomes incapable, right? So let's will, talk about who that. Will it be? So if that individual becomes incapable someday due to their illness, caregivers should even be thinking right now: who will make the decision? Then you go back to the hierarchy: is there a power of attorney? Have I seen a copy of it? Who has the copy? So it's very important that you start thinking ahead, either for yourself. I always say to people, when you look at that section 20 list, that ranking we just put up, do you know yourself? Who would be your substitute decision maker if something were to happen to you and you were incapable? So the caregiver may become the, the patient's substitute decision maker or may not. So you, you'll want to know that so that you can move quickly into the situation because sometimes you don't get great warning that mm -hmm. a health crisis mm -hmm. is upon you. Right. And one of the reasons that it also matters is it's sometimes a bit complicated if the caregiver is asking the healthcare provider to share information and yet that that caregiver is not the substitute decision maker. Let's say you are incapable and I come along as your family member 
and caregiver and I say to the practitioner, well, I would like access to certain information or I'd like to have a conversation with you and there is a substitute decision maker in the wings. It's the substitute decision maker who gets to decide whether you who are going access. to be privy to the conversation or the record. So that, that sometimes gives people pause. So this is exactly why the healthcare providers sometimes stop and they, they feel a bit paralyzed by privacy because they're not sure whether they're able to share the information mm -hmm. with you. And in fact, they really can't without the consent in that case of the substitute decision maker. But I'm saying, and the concern of the Change Foundation has been, if there is consent, if either that capable person or if they're incapable, their substitute decision maker has said, go right ahead, share the information with so-and-so, then we want that information to flow. Mm -hmm. Again, mm -hmm. there's so many pressure points in the system. So there's frustration. Sometimes caregivers feel like the main historian where they have to give <laughs> information over and over and what medications is your mother on and they do it with every practitioner. So they get frustrated there. And then on the other hand, even though they've been the ones providing all the information, they sometimes then can't get information at the other end of the uh, spectrum. So it's important to have the conversation and if you're in a caregiving role to understand some of these things uh, or ask questions about it and, and have an open conversation with providers yep. uh, and with the person you're caring for so exactly. that you know where you stand before it becomes a crisis. Yeah. Right. And sometimes I think that last bullet is really about the fact that it might be a verbal consent that then the, the healthcare provider just documents. I spoke with the patient. She's fine if her sister Genevieve gets the information or there might be a form that they say, no, we need you to sign the form. So there you have it. So Mary Jane, just before you go into the next sort of uh, who's able to be a substitute decision maker, just want to recognize that we did get a particular question in about uh, a power of attorney case and we'll, we'll get to that at the end and another question about uh, telemedicine and how that impacts authentic authentication for providers. Yep, um, fair enough. So we'll, we'll, uh, put those towards the end, but just wanted to let folks know that we did see those questions. So let's go on through this content and then we'll get to that. So can anyone be a substitute decision maker? Again, you have that ranking of the list, but there are special rules in terms of becoming a substitute decision maker. So if you're stepping up from a caregiving role into being a substitute decision maker, you have to be willing to do it. And maybe that's not a huge hurdle. You have to be available and the occasional scenario we're presented with is where the healthcare providers are somewhat chasing the substitute decision makers who won't come to meetings or don't, don't engage in the conversation. And so sometimes we've made sure that we've laid out, look, to be a substitute decision maker, you have to be willing, you have to be available and available means engaging with us because there's a proposed treatment on the table here and we wanna make sure that, that we get the appropriate consent. If you aren't willing and available and you don't meet these other criteria, you could be bypassed. You have to be at least 16, uh, 16 years of age, unless of course it's a parent who's 15 consenting on behalf of an infant, for example, not prohibited by court order or separation agreement and the person himself or herself has to be capable. So every now and then we'll have a case where the person is incapable. They are not able to make a decision on behalf of their loved one. Mary Jane, we're getting, uh, we're, we're about a half an hour into our call. So um, I know our next uh, slide is on um, when substitute, whoops, sorry, substitute decision makers don't agree. Let's just go. Yeah. Um, but I think we've Covered talked this. about a lot yeah. of stuff. So, okay. Well, yeah. So we've said yeah. tiebreaker, public yeah. guardian and trustee, last resort. They also are the Tiebreaker, sometimes staff start to get into the family dynamics of, well, this is the person who visits all the time, this is the person who's not, that's not the test either. And I think we've, we've said, if you cannot come to consensus, it may have to move over to someone else, but we hope there's a bit, again, a nuanced conversation about that. So we got, we got questions up front about what about pediatric settings and what are the age limits for consent for treatment and information sharing. and. Um, let's, let's go through that because that was an interest of people in our audience. Yeah, so healthcare consent, no age. PHIPAA 
came after the Healthcare Consent Act, and there was some discussion about could we make special rules around kids under 16? And so here it is. And we can always come back to this, but just to quickly run you through it. 16 and up, this is, this is again about information sharing, not about treatment. If there's an information decision to be made and the child is 16 or over, they make the decision about consent to collect, use, and disclose their information. If the child is under 16, either the child or the parent can give the consent. And the, the example I started to say was a camp note. If my 15-year-old son needs a camp note, yes, by law, we could go to him and have him understand what PHIPAA is. You might just come to me and say, hey, give the consent to release the medical information to the camp. So that just makes sense. But let's say that my son had participated in treatment that he gave consent to, because even at 15, he could, or counseling that the child participated in, in his own right. In that case, you would not be coming to me as the parent. It, if those records that we're talking about releasing or doing something with are records of treatment or counseling that he consented to capably in his own right, then it's unfortunately not the parent's business. And this I know can be controversial for those of you who work with youth or those of you who are parents of youth who want access to the information. And if the child's capable and the parents don't agree, child's wish prevails. Um, we've had a, a few questions have come through. We had questions ahead of time about sharing information uh, and special rules in a mental health situation. We just had a question come in that, that asked, um, that's a high priority question in the mental health setting is, if a patient says you cannot speak to my caregiver, what can a provider, what can a provider talk to a caregiver about? So, and I think we cover that in this scenario and we had another question uh, that was sent in ahead of time that addressed that yeah, same Yeah, we're going to come so into the scenario in a moment. And I think going back, uh, you'll see we, we had some conversation about what else can you do? If you have that nuanced pause and get to why it is that the person is instructing that the caregiver not receive information and you try to narrow it to look, if we could just give your mom and dad the discharge note so they can help support you when you're released from hospital and you're going home to live with them, then uh, there, there may be some option, but really, truly, at the end of the day, if it's the person's decision that, no, I don't want information shared, then the health uh, care provider's hands are tied a little bit. So there might be some other general information you can give, but... So you go back to that nuanced approach of yeah. kind of having a discussion. And if it's ultimately no, then it's no unless there is some other, and again, that risk provision I mentioned, disclosing to reduce or eliminate a significant risk of serious bodily harm. If I were the parent, let's say of my 15 year old, saying to a doctor who said, I can't share anything with you, I might say, well, he's locked in his bedroom, he's painted the windows black, I think mm. it's a risk situation, you have the authority to share information with any person to reduce or eliminate a significant risk of serious bodily harm under section 40 sub 1 of the HIPAA. maybe that would uh, give something. So let's just see. PHIPA generally, we've already said, providers need legal authority to collect, use, or disclose a patient's personal health information. There are different kinds of consent. There could be an express consent. There is an implied consent for information to flow between healthcare providers, just because that's so we don't impede care. And then there are lots of situations where there is no consent required for all kinds of activities. And then if another law says that the information can be collected, and the example I gave before was a form one under the Mental Health Act, if you are a, a mother standing in the emergency room, I would keep saying you have the authority to collect this information on the form one. If you're considering an application for psychiatric assessment, you have the authority to collect it for me. It says so right on the form or that timeliness and accuracy piece. I don't think we need to talk at length about 35 sub two of the Mental Health Act. It's just to say that even outside PHIPAA, under the Mental Health Act, there is an opportunity if the person's detained under the Mental Health Act or the forensic provisions of the criminal code, the healthcare organization can continue to collect, use, and disclose without consent the information. It can't be locked down by the patient 
in that situation because it sits under the Mental Health Act and those people are detained. And sometimes I think people forget that this particular provision exists. Okay, so LockBox, some of you will know mainly because someone will say, I don't want information shared. The only thing I want to say about LockBox in our time constraint is that a LockBox that I ask for as a patient only applies to the information flowing amongst the healthcare providers. It's not a locket at the center of the universe, never to be seen, seen again. And that is frustrating to patients because sometimes they say, lock it, and they don't realize it's, it's a very uh, thin locking. So how about when, um, do caregivers have their own rights to access the patient's health record, particularly if some of the information in the health record is about the caregiver? Which it might complicated. be. Maybe, yeah. maybe I go and I tell the health care provider lots of things about you, and then you come knocking and you say, I know he was talking about me. I want to know what's in the record. That's about me. It's actually a record of personal health information of the patient. So you don't, you would not get access. The only time you would get access is if you stepped into the shoes as my substitute decision maker. So if the caregiver becomes the substitute decision maker or with consent, I might say, yeah, feel free to share, share the information with Genevieve. So we, I think we got a couple questions in that were that I think we could probably answer quickly that I think maybe we could handle before we get into this sure. to the case. One is, um, can, and I think you covered this in that uh, given that uh, adult children, for example, in a family might have equal rank, uh, rank could could that group of folks get together and say we're going to have one of our one of our yes. group be the substitute decision maker? Well, again, or they could just say we're going to follow the word of that. It sounds like it's an informal decision. Right. right. So sometimes even the healthcare providers will say, "Could you guys get it together and and even appoint a spokesperson?" So that's the difference between is it everyone making a decision together and it's being communicated through one, or is it that some have said. I know I'm equally ranked under that ranking, but I don't really want to do it. And I would defer to whatever Genevieve says because she's on site with my mom and I live somewhere away. So those are a couple of options, of course, absolutely appropriate. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you get when the, the equally ranked people start to fight about it. And that's very hard on the providers as well. And we had a related question that somebody asked, do, do the do the equally ranked substitute decision makers have to come to consensus? But uh, yes. in essence, they do. They do have yeah. to come to consensus. Otherwise, the public guardian and trustee must make the decision. I'm just saying we would, before we go running to PGT, we would probably at least have a conversation to remind them of that and to help them try to get to that consensus. Some cases never come to consensus. One of the other questions that came in was a specific around, uh, let's say someone who has power of attorney lets a provider into a, a patient or client's home to, to do an assessment. And um, while the provider's in the home, the uh, person who's the power of attorney discloses some information uh, that the patient told them, um, but the patient didn't want the provider to know about it. So it's, it's a bit of a, the, the patient told the power of attorney some information and the power of attorney is now sharing it with the provider, but kind of doesn't, doesn't want the patient to know they told them. What's the Is that person scenario? an actual substitute decision maker? Well, power because of if, attorney. If they are, yeah. yeah. So yeah. an attorney for personal care is a substitute decision maker. The point at which you step into my shoes to make my decision I would probably say you are going to share what you want. Now, the caveat is a substitute decision maker is not acting on their own behalf. They're acting for the patient and the prior capable wish of the patient prevails. So you might have to actually consider, did this person want me to share it? Oh, no, she did not. And then you might have to think, is there some other reason that I would be sharing it and, mm. and that can be tough. Okay. Want to jump into Maria? Yeah, let's jump into Maria because some of the question, other questions we got ahead of time. We've, been, we've embedded, yeah, we've some, embedded of them. some of them in here. So, and maybe they'll also answer some of the ones that are coming in now. We're trying to keep up with the questions that are coming in and, and slot them in at appropriate times. Okay, so we've got Maria, she's 85, uh, diagnosis of early stage Alzheimer's. Her husband, George, we're saying this because who would be the substitute decision maker if and when there's a need? Uh, someday. 
George is, she's married. He's not very engaged in her care. She lives at home for now. That's a signal that things may be on the move for Maria. And her daughter who lives locally coordinates all the medical appointments among other things. So her name is Rochelle. You'll see her in just a moment in the slides. Mm -hmm. And yes, she is the one who is reaching out and making the appointments and arranging for the care and maybe driving her mother and trying to keep the household running and keeping George and Maria in their home. So that's fine. I think health practitioners need to recognize that Rochelle is ultimately not the patient or client once these things move forward, even if she is a person who arranged it. So it, it wouldn't be sensible to say that a practitioner can't engage with the adult daughter to make the appointments, but once you bring Maria in, of course, you're going to talk to Maria and sort it. And this is one of the complaints people will have sometimes, nobody talked to me, they only talked to my daughter. Mm. So Maria lives at home. We've got George in the wings. We've got Rochelle doing all of this stuff. Who makes the treatment decisions for Maria? Let's say there's a proposed treatment. Well, let's go back to that. So who makes the treatment decisions? Is it George? No, first of all, is it Maria? And it may be. Let's not assume that Maria is incapable just because she has a mm -hmm. diagnosis of early stage mm -hmm. Alzheimer's. She's entitled to be presumed capable and then otherwise someone would have, the proposing practitioner would have to assess her and conclude that she is or is not capable. So I think it's probably Maria at this juncture. If it were not Maria, let's say she's incapable, we would go back to that section 20 hierarchy and we would start at the top. Nobody's gone and gotten guardianship. Maybe there is not a power of attorney that's been written. Nobody's gone to the consent and capacity board. It would be George. So just because he's not engaged, now he could say, I'm, I'm tired <clears> myself, <throat> or I'm mm -hmm. dealing with my own health issues. I'm not willing, I'm not available. He may not use the words of the test, but if he doesn't want to be it, then he doesn't need to be. He himself could be incapable for other reasons, so he would then be bypassed. Then we would be down to, is it Rochelle? And is Rochelle the only child? Maybe there's another child who lives locally or even a child who lives away. Often there's a child from away and they pop up at some point in time. So we've said Rochelle's the one bringing her to the appointments and gets there one day with her mother and it's becoming more and more of a struggle to get her mother out, maybe in the winter elements and maybe her mobility is compromised and all of a sudden She's, Rochelle is upset because she says, my mother had those tests done and what do you mean you haven't received the results? So Rochelle is feeling a bit frustrated as a caregiver already. So when Rochelle gets in touch with the original provider, let's say a local hospital where the diagnostic imaging was done, well, no, we need a signed consent to transfer anything over to the receiving provider. So my point is based on implied consent, they could they could actually just provide them to the, to the clinic or wherever Rochelle has taken her. We did put in a note about, well, what about an expired consent mm -hmm. even more generally? So consents, sometimes people will put dates on them, which is always a worry as well, that because they don't necessarily expire, what we would want is to make sure that they are still current, not because of the date, but because the person in their context still under, is able to understand the information and um, nothing has changed dramatically. And one of the things we want to say about this is what if there have been consents done at other institutions or with other providers? Yes, the new institution could rely on it, but they probably have to turn their minds as practitioners to whether it's appropriate to do that because they don't know the full context of why that was done over here. Um, let's just see consent for information sharing. Let's not go too far down that path. And, uh, you know, we've talked about the particular family members. Maria says out loud, look, Rochelle's making all of my treatment and information decisions. Can you rely on this? Well, possibly. And it may well be Rochelle based on what we've said. Uh, Maria even says, I don't want any more hassle about this. Can I sign a form now while I'm capable for future? We're going to come to that in the next case scenario. So I think I'll, I'll move forward on that. Now, there's a couple of points on this slide that, that this related to, yeah, right okay. on this one that related to questions we got. Um, one is around if Rochelle in this case or, or any substitute decision maker isn't acting in the best interest of Maria. And then we also got a question is about what happens if Maria dies with no will and 
how can you get health records or yeah. death certificates? So could you so we're, just address those? So we've speeded up the situation yeah. to say, but is now at the end of her life. She's admitted to hospital. They turn to Rochelle appropriately to make decisions. And then they, the practitioners realize, wow, she's really making some quite poor, arguably poor decisions. Is it because she is herself incapable? And if she were incapable, ultimately she could be bypassed and there's no <clears throat> appeal of that. She might be quite capable, but making somewhat lousy decisions, in which case it's possible that you would have to go to the consent and custody board, the tribunal I mentioned, to do a Form G application to effectively challenge and have the board interpret whether or not you are going to rely on her. Maybe, she, maybe you detect as a provider that, look, Rochelle is quite earnest, but she keeps talking about what matters to her. She's not really acting for her mother. She's saying, well, I don't want to lose my mother. That's not the test. You step into the shoes as a substitute decision maker. You have to consider, did Maria have any prior capable wishes that apply? And just because you say she didn't want to live like this, but I don't want to lose her, it's all about interpreting Maria's prior capable wish or values and beliefs and other things. So that's what the board would look at mm. uh, if there were such a Form G application. And then she dies and she has no will. And this is not uncommon. <laughs> she dies without a will and there are questions later about release of her health records from that organization. So the rule in PHIPA is as to who makes decisions about consent to collect user disclosed personal health information. It's the estate trustee, so the executor under a will. So a, a, organization may ask the caregiver or the substitute decision maker or family member. There's no substitute decision maker once she dies, but they may turn to the family member and say, is there a will? Because Rochelle may say, right, I'm going to make these decisions. And then the organization has to pause and say, are you the estate trustee? Could you just bring us the front page of the will and then we'll make, let you make the decisions? Who knows? Even if there were a will, maybe Maria has named you, not Rochelle. So this is where some of the conflicts come up. If there is no will, which is often the case, it can be the person responsible for administration of the estate. So that could be informal, the person who made the arrangements for her body to be taken away, who gathered up the possessions. But organizations are quite cautious about this. If they detect that there is conflict or has been conflict throughout the course of her admission, they may have someone say, they may have them go and get uh, a certificate showing that they're the person responsible. And uh, these situations are a bit fraught. Okay, for the last uh, five to seven minutes or so of our sort of formal presentation, we're going to walk through um, a situation with a patient in, uh, around um, mental health questions, which we've gotten uh, like consent and disclosure of information in a mental health setting. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go through that and then we're going to stay online for about 20 minutes and answer some of the questions that are coming in that we haven't already dealt with. So just wanted just to give people a heads up. You have a lot of questions. Yeah, so we, and I've been trying to write them down. And um, yeah. So uh, if you see us glancing, it's because Yeah, I'm looking up at the screen. screen. Uh, so um, Mary Jane's going to walk us through the case study on Andrew, and then we'll get to as many of the questions that you've sent in as possible. And if we don't get to them all, we'll, we'll yeah. collect them and we'll write an answer and post that with the, the slides and the recording yeah. of the webinar as well. So we don't want to leave any of the questions unanswered, but probably won't be able to get to all of them while we're live online. So go ahead, Mary Jane. So let's talk about Andrew. We're shifting gears a little. We've, we've seen Maria through to the end of her life. Now we're talking about Andrew. So the patient Andrew is worried that his healthcare providers are going to share his personal health information with his parents or conversely collect it from them. It'll be flowing both ways. So the first question we pose is, is there a difference between a parent telling the provider something versus the provider telling the parent something? So it's which way is it flowing and does it matter? And years ago, we used to caution the healthcare providers, look, you can't disclose what you have but you can listen. With PHIPAA, that's changed a little bit. As I said, you can't just collect a lot of information without legal authority, without consent, or using that timeliness and accuracy provision that I pointed to. And there's still duties in terms of disclosing as well as about collecting. If the provider is worried about breaching privacy and consequences, it, it 
this is exactly the paralysis that we sometimes see with providers. <clears throat> they, are, they are worried that they're going to break a rule. They're not sure whether they can hear the story, let's say, of Andrew's parents. And again, this is why I reminded you of that clause. If, if they're asking the practitioner to disclose personal health information because of a really risky situation that the practitioner doesn't even know about, and this is not uncommon, unfortunately. Again, I don't know that you're going to be citing provisions of PHIPAA back to that healthcare practitioner, but healthcare practitioners can share information with anyone to reduce or eliminate a significant risk of serious bodily harm, and maybe can and should. So it, it's just important that the care, both the practitioners and the caregivers understand the, the legal parameters. I understand why people have a bit of this paralysis because they see a lot of privacy decisions on the front page of the paper and they don't want to misstep in the college's care and everything else. Does Andrew's age matter? Well, as I said, and you'll flip back later when you have the slides to that special set of circumstances about kids under 16. But let's assume Andrew is over 16. He's making his own decisions. And so then it's going to depend on his capacity and whether or not his parents are a substitute decision maker or there's some other legal authority like the Form 1 collateral information or the timeliness or accuracy to allow this, this ebb and flow of information. In this scenario, we're saying, what if Andrew's in the emergency department suicidal? So we have what we would perceive to be a live mental health issue actively happening. Does the clinical team have authority to collect information from the family? Yes, they do. Under the Section 36 provision around timeliness and accuracy, which hopefully they know, but, but they may not because it was new to PHIPAA, if they cannot get information in a timely or accurate way, they could collect it or they can collect it as I said, on the Form 1 under the Mental Health Act as collateral. Uh, what if he's detained on a Form 4? Well, remember we said there was that Section 35 sub 2 mental health piece as well that the practitioner could, could always, without consent, collect, use, or disclose personal health information if you are detained under the Mental Health Act or the forensic provisions of the criminal code. What if Andrew says, I want a lockbox? Again, if he's under the Mental Health Act detained or as a forensic client in the criminal code, the lockbox doesn't trump that other provision in the Mental Health Act. Otherwise, he would generally be allowed to have a lockbox, again, keeping in mind that a lockbox only locks it down as among his healthcare providers, because sometimes someone like Andrew will come and say, I do not want you to use my information for any purpose. I do not want you to share it anywhere for any purpose. And then we have to gently say, well, there are lots of ways where we disclose information without consent. There are lots of ways that we use information without consent under PHIPAA. Can he be chemically restrained even if he capable, oops, if capably he refuses treatment? So this scenario does come up sometimes. Let's say we turn to Andrew, we propose a particular treatment he says, well, thanks for telling me about the risks and the benefits. He, he's able to understand the information. He's able to, to appreciate the reasonably foreseeable consequences. And frankly, he says no. So then the question is, he has declined to have the proposed treatment that everyone around him thinks he needs. And he said no. What if he starts to get quite violent toward himself or someone else, another patient, his family, staff, whomever? Can he be chemically restrained? And we use that term because that term is in the Healthcare Consent Act, and it's very clear that chemical restraint for that safety issue is not treatment. So practically speaking, let's say it's Genevieve who is acting erratically and unsafely, and we think, wow, we need to contain the situation. We could use that same treatment that we proposed that he declined intramuscular injection, X milligrams, et cetera, we could use it and inject her with it as a chemical restraint, but that is not treatment. So the mm -hmm. only caution for providers is you can't do an end run on someone who's capably refused a treatment by then saying, well, we'll just chemically restrain them every three hours mm -hmm. for the next three weeks. That's not chemical restraint. Chemical restraint is meant to be a you know, one-time or limited episodic response to contain a dangerous situation. So that's the caution. 
Andrew lives at home for a while. He even starts taking the treatment, and this is the cycle in mental health that many of you will have experienced. He soon starts to feel better. And so I feel great. I'm going to skip my meds. I don't need them. And then I don't need them at all. His behaviors return. Next step. So possibly application for psych assessment, which is something that any doctor who's seen him within seven days can sign if the applicable criteria are met. Form two application to a justice of the peace. This isn't done as often and families sometimes don't want to do that because it looks overtly as though they've gone to do this and, and are interfering, but it's there. And sometimes if, if the doctor hasn't seen him within seven days, then the form one's not going to be possible. So probably he'd go to emerge and someone would see him there if you can get him there. Police powers under the Mental Health Act, section 17. Police sometimes intervene if they're called and they'll exercise their authority to take the person to hospital and then they still have to be seen by two separate physicians. And then there's a whole other scheme around community treatment orders and what that can uh, permit. And then once this happens, let's say I come in to hospital, I get placed on a form one, a second physician is gonna see me, the authority to detain me or Andrew in this case is up to 72 hours. I wanna make really clear that it's not always 72 hours for the detention examination observation and assessment. Families sometimes think, okay, Andrew's gone. Mm -hmm. We're gonna get three days and we need the respite and this has been so hard. And then 20 hours later, he's back. So mm -hmm. it's, it's up to, and if I don't meet the criteria to either stay as a voluntary or involuntary patient, then the organization, the officer in charge, must release me. So that's important all of a sudden. Andrew may be home uh, almost without warning. Could Andrew sign something while to permit sharing of information or treatment in the future when he's unwell and refusing? So let's say you've gone through the cycle a couple of times and Andrew says, wow, I feel like I've, I've had a setback. I've missed my university training. I keep getting sick and I keep refusing and I keep exercising my rights all the way through the system, which is his right, he could sign something, a special power of attorney called a Ulysses contract informally under the Substitute Decisions Act. I think it's section 50. It's quite uncommon and it really is intrusive because it strips away your right. I would be deciding today to give away my rights in future. So it's not common, but it is, I've seen those cases where someone just says, yeah, we know this is gonna happen again Let's just deal with it now. Upfront. Yeah, we did get a question about that ahead of time. So okay, so let's start yeah. to answer some of your questions. Right. I didn't so, put my glasses on. Okay, so we had one. Me. We had one a while ago that was uh, a bit of um, hasn't been related oh, to a, a lot of the one. topic topics we addressed. But somebody wrote mm -hmm. in and said, you know, doing telemedicine. So you know, you're face to face with somebody, maybe doing a psychiatric assessment or any kind of assessment. How does that change? authentication for the provider like what what's... an authentication of what because a lot of care is delivered by telemedicine including right. psychiatry so, and other other domains so do you just rely on the uh sort of standard uh consent stuff or is there any yeah. special stuff around telemedicine that providers need to be aware of well i think generally for telemedicine you're gonna be held to the same standard. So if there are records available from that other place where the person is, it would be great to have them to bolster the review. You have to have a connection, you know, such that you can properly, properly do the assessment that you're being asked to do. But there are different groups, including, I guess I'm focusing on psychiatry, but it, it's often done for yeah. all kinds of, of clinical interventions that uh, like a group like CAMH, I think it is, has, has very good standards and other people have been asking, well, what kinds of standards should we have in place? So I would think all of the same rules apply in terms of being diligent that, you know, this is who you're speaking with or this is a substitute decision maker. I don't know that it, I don't know that it goes so much beyond just because we have the technology. And we do, we do want to use the technology, especially if it means someone can get the care that they need without having to travel you know, many remote areas or, or specialists are few and far between. I guess for providers just taking reasonable precautions to make sure if you're talking to someone that they are who they say they are and that, yeah. That, yeah. 
Um, we had a question that related to something we talked about at the beginning, and it's probably a, an easy answer, but you mentioned the, the special rule about for hospitals and long-term care homes and yes. being able to say someone's there and Correct. even kind of where they are. Yes, exactly. Um, does oh, that and, and also how they're doing. Oh, oh yeah, gosh, their condition, like, yeah. Does that, does that apply to hospice care facilities no. as well? We got a no. question about hospitals that. hospitals and long-term care homes okay. were the two that are mentioned in the app. Okay, um, we got a question also about um, what's the process for deeming a substitute decision maker incapable? So great. what's- That's a great yeah. question. So it doesn't precisely say in the Healthcare Consent Act that you would use the section four test of incapacity that you would apply to a given patient when you propose a treatment. But I think by default, that is the test that many health practitioners will apply. If, again, if they think, wow, that decision is, is really <clears throat> unusual and it's either just not good for the person, for the patient, I wonder if the person, this person is incapable or mm -hmm. are they capable of just making this poor decision such that we're gonna send it over to the Consent and Capacity Board. So again, it would be important to have a discussion, I think. It, the Act doesn't say you go to section four and sort out whether you are able to understand the information and able to appreciate the reasonably foreseeable consequences, but that really is the default. And then you would want a document say, you know, in fact, we found you to be incapable in terms of making mm. your mother's decision. Mm. This is not going to be popular yeah. at all. And the only way that I've, so I said, there's no real right of appeal. What I have seen people do is they will then apply to the consent capacity board to be a representative. And you remember in the ranking representative was ranked higher and they're not always successful because they're trying to outrank themselves. And the reason they were unsuccessful is because they were incapable. And of course, that's gonna be one of the tests mm. to go further up, but. Yeah, so that's, that's a, that's that's a tricky happens. situation. Um, I, th I think I know the answer to this or, or how you might react, but we got a question about what happens when um, the, the providers are making decisions that are in disagreement with what the patient wants and the substitute decision maker wants or the so you know kind of i guess pushing a treatment that the oh, other folks don't like right you know what's the what so oh, how do people stop that right so a practitioner is entitled to propose a particular treatment they do not interpret the wishes of the patient they to the best of their clinical ability have to gather the information and then propose a treatment. And if I don't like the treatment, if I'm capable, I could say, you know, for all of those reasons, you mentioned certain risks, I'm not willing to gamble with that. My answer is no, or a substitute decision maker mm -hmm. could say no. But the to be really clear, healthcare providers who propose treatments have no ultimate decision making authority. They can propose what they wish, and, and the argument might be, well, they're not listening to us, mm -hmm. because we've already been through this, but they are merely putting together some sort of proposed treatment plan, and then it's over to the substitute decision maker to interpret any wishes that the patient might have had, or if, if you're capable, you get to decide. So again, I think there's a way to have a conversation with a practitioner to say, you know, I hate to say it, but I'm not sure you're listening to us. We've been really clear, my mother was, saying, you know, she would never want such and such or whatever it is. But the, the practitioners are not actually making decisions in this transaction. They are using their clinical ability and judgment to propose what they would consider an appropriate treatment. And then it's over to the capable person or their substitute decision maker who then interprets their wishes. So it's, it's important that practitioners know that even if for some reason there's a power of attorney in the chart they also can't just pull it out and go, oh, here's what she said, I'll just go ahead mm. and, and this will be so. They, if, if they see it, they would still have to go to a substitute decision maker. So we had another question about a, a power of attorney situation, which I'm sure is pretty common. If, for example, um, one of two or three uh, adult children are named power of attorney for a parent or, and, or have no power of attorney and are just equally ranked. Yeah. And, and one of them, uh, the one who's named power of attorney goes out of town, out of the country, oh, right. whatever. But the ones that aren't, aren't named power of attorney are there every day providing care. Yes. Does that, 
power of attorney status go away because you're not physically there? Well, or back to the rules of are you, willing if you're available, and available by phone. Yeah, if and, you're still available by phone, years ago, yeah, we might not have said, oh, the person can't really be available because they're going to be off in the middle of nowhere with no means of communication. That might be a bit different, but today, that person could absolutely remain as substitute decision maker if they're still willing, available, and they meet the rest of the test. So I don't think that you certainly wouldn't set them aside just because they happen to be away. Now they might say, look, I'm just not going to be available. And then you would go to the next highest ranked people on the list. But, but there, there does need to be an attempt to contact the person, even if they're not well, if I If I said country, out loud to yeah. you, look, there's no way you're going to be able to reach me. Yeah. I'm going to step out until I come back. And it, it will default then to someone else. That's fine. I thought the question you might ask was, if I were going out of country and I am the attorney for personal care, could I then delegate it to mm, you? That's a good, good who, point. Who is not, you not being in the ranking? And my view is the answer is no. There's oh, no okay. authority of a substitute decision maker to delegate to others. Now, I've heard little glimmers that some people out there will say that, that they can, but along with the Advocacy Center for the Elderly, we've worked this through a few times and said, we don't see the authority to delegate your, your substitute decision making authority because those next people in line would be saying, well, it's actually us. And I think that's, that's true. So we got a question. This might be a quick one. Um, um, I guess in when there's uh, the parents aren't necessarily living together or there's cut child custody arrangements. How, how do you ensure when discussing information that, that, that the parent is really the custodial parent? Like what's, what are the, what are the things in place to make sure that yeah. they're really talking to who they're supposed to be talking to and not just someone yeah. that's claiming they have custody? Well, the, we do get this periodically and it is important for healthcare providers as they're going down through that list. The default is child or parent. So we're talking about parents of a child. The issue is while they are equally ranked, it also says that the custodial parent ranks ahead of the access parent. So you have this divide already in the healthcare consent tax. But we always say to the organizations, be careful with that because even if there's a custodial parent who outranks the access parent, there may be some function of, of custody and divorce issues, family law issues that elevates that access only parent uh, back up to the level of the custodial parent because the court has ordered that even though mom's a custodial parent that the dad can also share in medical decision making and have access to all of the records so we always we wouldn't ask every set of parents hey by the way is there strife is there a family law issue the default is that they make the decisions together but if you're aware that there is a custody divorce situation you want to know based on healthcare consent which one outranks the other and is anything else at play from a family law point of view court order that elevates that other parent back up to equal status that's really important i'm going to come back now to a couple issues that that were asked that we we touched on but maybe maybe we need to elaborate a bit on and one of them is um, just in general we talked about situations where um, the information absolutely needs to be gathered from a family member or caregiver just to help the patient in an immediate need. But in general, can caregivers just provide information to help the provider make a good decision? Um, it, it's that they're not getting information, but they're providing information. Yeah, and, and that's and, the it's old a bit sticky. way. Yeah, that's so. the old way. We used to say, oh, don't you worry, practitioner, about collecting. Under PHIPA, it's not as simple. Okay. Under Section 36, you can't collect as a practitioner from that other person unless you have the authority. So okay. that authority is consent or that timeliness and accuracy okay. provision. But I'm not really convinced that every healthcare practitioner knows about the timeliness and accuracy narrow window to also then collect. So in general, you need, you need some authority to be able to get that information included in the record. Exactly. Yeah. And yet, sometimes practitioners will just collect away because right. I think they're thinking of the old rules and maybe that works out fine. 
Uh, but if you're, if you're getting a barrier as a caregiver, again, you don't want to be citing PHIPA back to the practitioner, but you could, you could say, I think you've got some ability to collect this from me because you can't get it. But then the practitioner is somewhat put to the test of, can you really not get it in a timely or accurate way if I can just call the son and ask? Yeah. Again, this, if the situation is not in this sort of weird, urgent scenario, mm -hmm. then he does have rights to not have, have that information. Yeah. So, you, so maybe the practitioner has to pause and say, we can call him and I can ask, or you can bring me a written consent, mm -hmm. but unless I can't get in, in a timely or accurate way in the circumstance, you know, I need some legal authority. And that, again, is going to be super frustrating for caregivers. And we got a question that's a, a bit of a nuance about when there's information in the record about the caregiver. Oh, and the way the question's question. asked, I think they're assuming that the caregiver um, is the substitute decision maker. Um, so if a client's not capable for consent and there is a substitute decision maker, do they have access to everything in the notes that might be about a caregiver, whether it's the substitute decision maker or a different caregiver? Is that the first question? Uh, the, uh, no, the, can you clarify the comment? It's the one, oh, I the see. third one down there. Okay, so can you clarify the comment about documenting notes about the caregiver and the client's chart? So if the, if the client or whoever owns, whoever the chart is about isn't able to consent, is the substitute right, decision maker right. have access to view the notes, whether the notes are about correct the substitute, the substitute decision, maker, decision maker as a caregiver or yeah. another person as a caregiver? So let's just play it out. That could mean that you've been the caregiver for years and you're now in a situation where the person is incapable and you are not stepping, I don't mean you're not stepping up by virtue of not wanting to, but you are not the legal substitute decision maker. So a substitute decision maker would then have access to everything in there, including potentially notes about you. Let's say my mother were complaining to her doctor about my bossy daughter wants me to do this and this, or I was abused as a child or whatever it is. Family history is personal health information of the patient or client. It's, it may be about you, but it doesn't give you a right of access. Only if you were a substitute decision maker would you, would you get that. Do we want to go to that first one? Yeah, let's go to the first. Mary Jane wants to go to that first question. That was going to be my next one. Uh, when okay. the healthcare provider is a relative of the patient, uh, is there written or verbal consent required to provide care and access records? So if I'm not mistaken, if this is about the healthcare provider having access by virtue, let's say, of their work, and even even if the patient said, hey, you can access it. To, so I want to make sure I've got the question right. So is there, it sounds like they're asking, is there a special uh, consent for access to the records when the healthcare provider is a relative of the patient? So let's say it's a you know, physician treating her father. Is there any special I mean, that would be request? A, uh, I mean, there are boundary and other practice issues in terms of treating family members. So that would be yeah. the first caution. I actually was thinking perhaps it was a healthcare provider has access through their work into, let's say, the electronic record or the paper records. What if they're the substitute oh. decision maker for, even if they're the substitute decision maker for the individual, can they go in the organization's records mm. as SDM. Well, no, because no. We, we have a special process for yeah. that. If you want access as a substitute decision maker or even as a capable client, then you go through health records or whatever the organization's process is. You can't just go in. Just because you're a provider and might have access to other records doesn't mean you no, can access. Exactly. Yeah, okay. And that's a real caution. We see that all over the province. And we remind people, you can't just go in and start reading your own record <laughs> or re because a health information custodian, the healthcare organization or provider, didn't give you authority to go into the system for that. They gave it to you so that you can provide care or assist in the provision of care to people. So that's not a need to know situation. No. That would be going in through the back door when you're meant to go, um, to go do that. Let's just see. Um, you want to just go take the next one on the lockbox. I think that one could be answered pretty quickly. Can you lockbox personal health information that's not related to a lawsuit? For example, gynecological information is lockbox, while broken ankle injury information from a slip and fall is not. 
So I'm not sure about the lawsuit commentary. It, any information, if you have, if, if there's no other reason to not give a lockbox, it's not a Section 35 Sub 2 of the Mental Health Act situation. If I request a lockbox, then again, lockbox is only about shielding it from healthcare providers. So even if you lock it down for one reason, it doesn't mean that it wouldn't be released for other reasons. You can't use a lockbox to protect against its disclosure in a lawsuit or anything else. And, and again, personal health information is very broadly defined and what might be sensitive to me, gynecological information, um, it, there's no special status for mental health or gynecological or addiction or whatever any of us might think of as being more sensitive. It's just your rights apply if I would like to lock it, it locks it for quite a narrow purpose, mm -hmm. to be frank. Mm -hmm. And then if there's some other reason that it's going to be compelled by law, it's still going to flow out. So um, okay. if we need to come back to that one, just in terms of the nuance around the lawsuit, we can do that. Just a, a, a note on time. We have about five more oh, minutes. We're going to stop at two o'clock and we're not going to get through all the questions, but yeah. we will uh, actually collect the questions that we haven't gotten to and prepare answers and email them out to everybody. But I'm going to let you take this next one because I'm not sure what they're asking, yeah. but I'm sure you so, do. So <laughs> when information is disclosed pursuant to the discretionary risk provision, so that's section 40 sub 1, any health information custodian can share, can disclose personal health information to reduce or eliminate significant risk of serious bodily harm. And the question here is whether or not Implementation, and I think there should be. We don't want people willy-nilly, there's a nice legal term, <laughs> to be disclosing all over creation under Section 40 sub 1. But it's meant to be done in a timely way, and we would want someone to, just to actually document that in this circumstance, whatever that is, we release the information based on Section 40 sub 1. You don't have to go and get consent. You don't have to go and give notice. And, in fact, in a risk situation, sometimes you're definitely not going to go and give notice to the person either. That's, a, that's not what the question was, but um, it, it is important to document that we relied on this authority and it doesn't have to be perfect. Someone might come back and criticize and say, I can't believe you released it in that circumstance. Well, I did it in good faith based on the information that we had at the time and you know, new information comes and you think, oh, I don't know if I had to do that. That's fine. We don't want people to pause too long and have privacy paralysis when this clause is in there to protect. So Mary Jane, I think this might, might be our last question, but, and, and uh, uh, this is similar to one we got earlier when someone who's a power of attorney disclosed health information to an agency, I'm assuming a healthcare provider, or community care provider, that the client yeah. who is competent didn't want disclosed. And then they asked, so, so the power of attorney even though they're competent, they have a power of attorney and that person disclosed information to the agency that the patient didn't want disclosed uh, and the information could impact the provider uh, and care, to, care provider, does the agency have the responsibility to let the Good client question. know that they have the information? It probably happens more. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, do you have a duty to say to that we you got this information inappropriately now. collected something that they didn't want <laughs> given in the first place? So, yeah, especially if they're competent. I would. It's interesting because yeah. there is a section of PHIPAA that talks about it's section twelve. There's notice to a patient, an affected individual, if information their information has been lost, stolen, or subject to unauthorized access. It doesn't really talk about the collection piece. I might have to come back to that one. And this one, just because we've gotten it twice, and I think yeah. this will be the last question we answer <laughs> live, is about family caregivers or, or people making uh, doctor's appointments for a family member who's over the age of 18. So can you call up and make Absolutely. Especially a mental yeah. health appointment for someone? Well, you can. But then what's the next, but, but yeah, think, what happens when they get there? Yeah, we've talked a little bit about the fact that the caution for the healthcare provider, it, I, we can't paralyze the system. Mm -hmm. So practically speaking, if you only get the phone call, I'm not going to really know much other than what you're telling me. So I think you're almost going to have to assume, because again, that's a collection, but I don't know how else we would do it other than you call and I say, all right, you're bringing your mother in. <laughs> And then when, I think that the main thing is when you come in with your mother that we 
don't assume that we're only talking to you, that the client ultimately is your mother. So again, otherwise the system is going to mm -hmm. grind to a halt. Okay, I think we're we're just about at two o'clock. The other ones seem a little bit a uh, little bit more uh, long to answer, but we have about five questions we didn't get to four or five, I think, and so we will do definitely. We try or are we are we out of time? Uh, what What do you think? I'm, I'm looking at my technical people here. Um, right. How about this one on? Um, do we need to ask for a power of attorney? Uh, every for each hospital visit. Oh, hold on. Hold on, we just. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for each hospital visit, once we know that a patient has been deemed incapable and has a recognized power of attorney, can we retain a copy on the patient's yes. health record, yes. which would so act? Yes. Short answer: If I were the hospital, I would ask for a copy, have it in the chart, and then unless there's something to displace it, there are new wishes or if, you know a new power of attorney revokes an old one. And then you have it, and then you can look to it. So I think that answers that. Okay, I think we're gonna since we're at two o'clock now. I think we've we've. Oh oh, I'm oh, happy to answer. Pierre saying, all right, all right, so we're gonna let uh, stay on Mary Jane do recording. rapid fire here. I'm just gonna let her read them. <laughs> um, okay, so I think we covered that first that one. First well, one, we're not sure, but you'll get back to them on oh, that right, one. Oh right, we've yeah. kept it because we're we're right. just gonna ask about the lawsuit information. So the next one's about can you lock information from a family member? Yes, For example, don't tell my sister in New York I have diabetes; it will worry her. If we otherwise have yes. consent of the patient to share information with the sister in New York, then, then could we not share the diabetes uh, diagnosis? Yeah, in fact, you cannot share it because she's capably instructed you do not share it. So even if you have then a blanket consent otherwise, you'd have to have that little carve out. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's difficult as the organization, okay, what, what are the limitations here? And, and have we been told not to discuss anything in particular, but that, that is accurate that you could, you would not have permission to share the diabetes. So this next question could Unless be, she oh, becomes sorry. your substitute decision maker. Yeah. Or there's other legal authority. This next question could potentially be a really long one or a really short one. Are there any <laughs> upcoming changes or revisions to these laws that we've been talking about that you're aware of? For example, yeah. uh, the, the questioner is asking lots of advocacy and family members are fighting for changes to some of these current laws. Yes. If, it, given the scenarios that we've talked through. Yeah. So are there changes on the, on the horizon? No, I've been working in mental health and in health law and in privacy for 20 years now, as of last week. And I'm, I'm not specifically aware that there are changes in, in the work. Certainly over time, there've been lots of, um, there've been lots of comments about it and the need for some change. There've been legislative reports. There've been different committees looking at issues. A lot of work done also through the Law Commission of Ontario. We've written two Law Commission papers on advanced care planning and healthcare consent and looking at some of those tools. So I appreciate how difficult it is, especially for family members who are trying very hard to advocate. And I think what I would say is, it, you know, at least I'm not aware, but I'm also not part of the legislature. Uh, there have been lots of discussions through a number of inquests over the years in different situations, and acts do get updated from time to time. It's been a little while, obviously, since the community treatment order scheme came in. It's actually been 18 years or more. Um, so ultimately, I, I don't know that it's imminent. One of the real challenges in the law, and some people would say, look, that's really good, others will say, no, it's entirely frustrating because we can't get the information we need, is the fact that we are in a very rights-based jurisdiction. And most of the law that gets interpreted and comes up through the courts is all about mm -hmm. my ability to say mm -hmm. no, to have you know, life, liberty, and security yep. of the person, and what does that mean? And I know people will, will argue that um, it's not really liberty if I'm declining and my family's trying to do stuff for me and I have so many rights that I can, but that is, that is where it is at the moment, but the, the debate is carrying on and it's been going on for many years now and there's well, a lot of frustration. And um, this next question is, is, is a scenario where 
uh, someone gets is under a form release, one, yeah. they get released after 72 hours, um, financially harmful to the family. Um, and, and the question is when a substitute decision maker tries to get physicians or the providers to keep someone longer so that they're sure they're taking their medication, um, you know, caregivers and family members are often frustrated with the folks are uh, under the medical system deemed able to make their own decisions about receiving treatment but they don't want to take the treatment, but when they're not taking the treatment, they're more of a burden to the family. So one of the things I point out here though, is again in Ontario and unlike some jurisdictions where you get treated on the consent of the medical director, for example, in BC, if you are involuntarily detained in Ontario, we've got two separate statutes going on. And one is the mental health act. So that's all about the potential that the mental disorder is driving harm to self-harm to others or serious physical impairment and that may result in them being detained or eventually having a form lifted or they don't stay in hospital as in this scenario and then there's the health care consent act so to me this question is a bit of a blend all of a sudden there's a substitute decision maker over there under the health care consent act if there is a substitute decision maker again they it, it's separate from the mental health act regime and the you know, whether the person is going to stay. So again, if you're the substitute decision maker or even the caregiver, it's can you get more information into the hands of the practitioners based on these privacy rules so that that the healthcare practitioner does think, oh gosh, yeah, based on that information, I'm starting to think that they meet the legal test. So that is um, that is definitely a... So that brings Challenge. up the question of if someone's deemed able to be released and not on a form one so anymore. Mental health, so not on a form one and yeah. not on a form three or form four detained in hospital. So they either don't meet the criteria and never get admitted, which I think is this scenario, or someone lifts the certificate and they're free to go. So if they're capable, even though you have a substitute decision maker, their two will separate. doesn't come into that then you know, because they're capable. Yeah, yeah. Two, two separate yeah, that's issues. Complicated. And then you, you, know, you may not agree that they didn't get admitted, which is why there's such a challenge of yeah. you getting the right information into the right hands and not having barriers put up there to try to convince them, look, the person needs to be admitted. They meet the criteria. Here are all the risks based on their mental disorder, harm to self, threats to us, whatever it is. And then on the other side, it's the Healthcare Consent Act. Your role as a substitute decision maker doesn't really impact other than you're a person with good information that you want to share to help, I guess, bolster the case that they really need to mm -hmm. be detained in hospital. This is so stressful for families. So we just have two more questions and thank you to everybody that's sending questions ahead of time and during this has really helped um, illuminate the um, stuff in the, the two laws. Um, this other question, access by parents to a child's record is very complicated any additional guidance would be appreciated. For example, do we need to ask if the parents are together if we don't already know? So if you're a provider and you don't know if parents are together and kind of on the same page with respect to the, the child, um, we want to follow the appropriate access to information rules, but do we need to ask if there's a custodial parent or what's the arrangement? Like, does that have to happen every time you see I a child? I don't know that you have to ask. I think you are entitled to rely on the fact that, now sometimes I would probe you know, the mom, if you've never seen the dad, you know, mm. is, is the dad engaged yeah. with, because that means they're going to be equally ranked. I don't know if I would ask every set of parents, you still happy, you married, <laughs> has custody, divorce, but, but it's true. So I think we went through some of it. Just the default is that both are ranked. So don't just assume there's only one parent. And, and even I've had cases where a team might say, well, he's not available because he's in jail or he's not available, he or she, I'm not singling out the gender. <laughs> That person, just because they're not engaged in the care, that is not the test. So they're equally ranked. And I think you do have to do the due diligence to say, is there anyone else who's equally ranked in any of these settings and not just assume it's the person who shows up that gets to make the decision. But again, if there is that, you know, any commentary about the, the custody divorce issues, you can look for the equally ranked or or if let's say the dad says, well, the mother's only a custodial, uh, sorry, the mother's only an access parent. 
I would probably push a little to say to the dad, well, she may be the custodial parent, but is there any sort of court order? Because you don't want, to, or if she's visiting, is there a court order that makes us do more? Mm. Is there a court order that pulls her ranking back up to be equal to his? And, and it is complicated, but default is both. If you know that they're not equally ranked, find out whether there's a court order or anything else at play. Yeah. And I think this last question is a bit of a clarification about, about one we attempted to answer earlier, and I think this clarifies it. So if someone slips and falls and is bringing a lawsuit because they broke their ankle, um, and that person also has gynecological information with another party in their record, when it has nothing to do with the ankle, can she lockbox that information about GYN problems so that in the lawsuit, only the things that are pertained around the broken ankle are accessible. Oh, I see. I mean, yeah. I don't want to comment on an act of proceeding <laughs> specifically. And, and again, all of this is really not legal advice. Yeah. It's, it's information about some laws. So um, do you have to share Specific all of the medical information about party. somebody if they're looking in at uh, one particular part I, I mean, I would think that at that point Someone may even have to get a court order mm -hmm. as to why You, you would know, need what that. is pertinent in the circumstance and, and again um, So she is the one who fell and someone is suing on her behalf behalf yeah, I think I better just not weigh in on that. I mean, I have seen I have seen court proceedings where, you know, someone is put to the test as to why, you know, and sometimes even a court order will say all relevant mm. or it'll say all mm -hmm. information. So you want to proceed. Quite. So lockbox isn't necessarily the vehicle oh, for this, but lockbox that's has yeah. nothing to do with yeah. this because that's only amongst yeah. healthcare providers. This is about a third party it's a yeah. proceeding that she has started. And then the other side wants to know, did she have some pre-existing right, something that, situation? Yeah. And I, suppo I suppose, and I mean, they, she has a lawyer, so that lawyer should know. I think that's beyond, <laughs> beyond yeah, the scope I mean, of what we can answer that. on this but, call. But, so. You know, maybe, some, maybe that lawyer would choose to say, we're not releasing something, bring us a court order, and then they'll go from there. But I would definitely go back to the lawyer hired for the suit. Uh, around that around that piece. So we are going to get an answer to that one question that, that we need to think a bit more about on uh, disclosing information to the client uh, that they said they didn't want disclosed. So we'll, we'll have to write that one out and send it out to everybody. But I think we covered all the other questions and we'll scope back through and make sure. Um, but thank you again for your attention. This was really a long time to sit on a webinar and we yeah, appreciate those of you that hung in the whole time. And uh, thank you very much. And the report is on our website and we'd be um, happy to have you sign up for our newsletter and any other Change Foundation bulletin. So on behalf of Mary Jane and myself and our able technical staff of Pierre and Catherine, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks everyone.